المشركات ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما صدق الله العظيم on today, I know that there were a lot of people who were, uh, were there with the family, and uh, I'd like to pass on my, my love and respect to the brother and his family. I know Abu Baker uh, also passed on not long ago, uh, very unexpectedly, and um, I always like to think that when people with such good quality pass on, that it makes us stronger and more committed, so love and respect to the family members. In line with what was said earlier, I'm of the belief that uh, this world is completely and totally unacceptable, and I'm not content to continue this game of shifting blame to others. I see the problems of this world as a reflection of our inability to confront the truth and act on the truth and do what we're capable of doing, continuously being manipulated, divided, and fighting each other for the crumbs that the powers that be at the top of the pyramid dole out to us. In truth, I actually have a certain amount of respect for these tyrants because they couldn't possibly get away with what they're doing unless we, the masses, allow them to do this. They mock us every single day, and we continue to allow ourselves to be in this powerless position, forever victimized by their tyrannical game. But I'm not content to blame them. I really believe it's imperative that we take a look at ourselves, stand in front of a mirror, and realize that the problem before us is ourselves. And if we ever do decide to actually come together, then we will make a better world. And if we fail, in my opinion, we're going to find ourselves in a situation while we sit here on the brink of a third world war, full scale third world war, with dangerous psychopathic criminals at the top of the pyramid who are instigating this third world war to the best of their effort through their minions and the media. If we allow this to happen, Having been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and having met survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, having listened to their stories about what it was like in the aftermath of the two greatest terrorist acts in the history of this world, the dropping of atom bomb, uh, atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb in those two cities, it was hell on earth. And we sit here now purged on the verge of full-scale global nuclear war. So I don't think that we can be risking too much in stopping this disastrous course. And I myself am the first one to acknowledge that I'm responsible. When I grew up in America, like every other American, I believed that my nation was the greatest in the world. I thought it was the bastion of freedom and democracy. And like every American, I took pride in being an American. I joined the Marine Corps at the age of 19, believing that, as stupid as it sounds, it's a very powerful thing, indoctrination. We're indoctrinated on many different levels. People are indoctrinated religiously, culturally, racially, on many different levels. And ultimately, I was so stupid as to believe the lies that my nation had told me, and I joined the Marine Corps. I was sent off to what they call a war, the first Gulf War, 1991, but it's like every other so-called war that America fights. It's really more of a slaughter than it is a war. A war denotes two opposing entities and some semblance of a chance between one or the other. America never fights enemies that can actually fight back. We always fight those that we know we can destroy. America, in my opinion, is a cowardly nation that uses its high-tech weapons to destroy people's lives, and all the while pretending that it is somehow a friend to the people and a friend to the dem democratic cause. We all know, obviously, this is untrue, but I feel a responsibility for my own ignorance, having put myself in a position where I could have killed, been killed or killed others. Thankfully, I never had to kill anybody when I was in the Marine Corps. If I had to do it, I would have done it. And I don't know if I would have ever recovered, but thankfully I did not have to do that. But nonetheless, it imparted in me a responsibility because I knew that I have partaken in what is a slaughter. 
And I'm also fully aware in the case of Iraq of the use of depleted uranium, which I consider to be one of the gravest crimes against humanity. And I don't know how many of you are aware of what depleted uranium is, but it's nuclear waste, effectively. It's nothing more than nuclear waste, toxic radioactive waste that is used to uh, create weapons that are armor piercing. And when we fire these weapons, these rounds explode and they heat up very intensely, create dust fragments. And those dust fragments are then breathed into the lungs of any, anybody in the area. I've been down to southern Iraq and I have visited the children's hospital down there and I have seen photo album after photo album of little children being born that don't even look human. They look like little mutant monsters, quite frankly. And this is going to happen not only for this generation and the next generation, but for generations to come. And America knows this. And the Israelis have recently used depleted uranium in Operation Cast Lead. We're using depleted uranium in Afghanistan as well. This stuff is going to kill for generation after generation. And again, America knows this. Israel knows this as well. The British know this as well, because they're using these weapons. And at the end of the day, how could they do this? Unless we allow them to do this. Can I just check everyone from here? Is everyone OK hearing? I the sisters at the back. Can you hear? Yeah? Everyone can hear. Sorry. <coughs> what I see in this world is one illusion after another. But the illusion that was thrust upon me, like all other Americans, was this illusion of freedom and democracy and all this bogus stuff. And the illusion is powerful. The indoctrination process is very powerful. But unless we can manage to see through this indoctrination, what chance do we have to solve our problems? Unless we can see the world for what it is, how is it possible to solve the problem? And again, at the end of the day, how many are we and how many are those in power? We outnumber them, millions to one, when it comes down to it. So how pathetic is it that we, we the masses, we have all this power, and yet we allow ourselves to be continuously divided? And how do they do this? It's one lie after another, but if there is a head to the snake, it is the financial system. This financial system, which is the most fraudulent scam in the history of our world, is probably responsible for more death and suffering than any other system. And I actually thank God that the people of the West are starting to feel the pain of the so-called financial crisis. I thank God for that. And I, I can't wait for it to get worse and worse and worse. And it will get worse. And at the end of the day, they try and make this financial system all this parade of so-called experts and economics people and all these people, prostitutes more than anything else, prostitutes who sell their soul to try and confuse us and use us. A short breakdown, because it's not complicated at all. And there's a fantastic film online called The Money Masters. Go and Google that movie, The Money Masters, a brilliant film. There's a lot more out there as well, but I highly recommend that film. It'll take you two hours to watch it, but by the end of it, you will know what a fraud is being perpetuated against all of us. As we sit here in Britain, a prosperous country, or in America, or in Europe, as we sit here and these powers that be, these prostitutes posing as prime ministers, as parliamentarians, as congressmen and senators, who are these people? They're nothing more than prostitutes, and who do they serve? They serve the 1%. They serve the filthy rich. They serve those people that run the financial system. What is the financial system? And everybody here, most of you are Muslims, you've got to know one of the best things about Islam is there is no usury. Usury is haram, not allowed. Probably one of the great reasons why Islam is so vilified, one of many reasons why. Why is usury haram? Well, we know why it's haram, because it's, in, it's meant to enslave people. But the short story, for those that don't know the financial system, incredible scam. Money has been allocated to those at the top of the pyramid. Those people are the ones that are allowed to print the money. In America, it's the Federal Reserve. Here, it's the Bank of England and the European Central Banks. These fraudsters are allowed to print money out of thin air, backed by nothing, backed by nothing. And they were given that power by our corrupt, greedy, pathetic so-called leaders, whether they're prime ministers or politicians, all of them traitors with the rarest of exceptions. They have given the power on behalf of us, who they supposedly speak for, for these tyrants to be able to print the money. They then loan the money. They then loan the money to the banks at interest. At interest. We pay interest to people who print money, which we could print ourselves debt-free. And yet we allow them to do this. 
So they print the money and then they loan it to the banks at which we own the interest. And they've had this fraudulent system in existence for many, many hundreds of years now. And this system is inherently debt driven. The point of it is to indebt us so that we have to pay more and more taxes to pay off a debt that can't possibly be paid off. Because the amount of debt that is created from the money that is printed, there is not enough money in circulation to pay off the debt. So there will always be debt. There is no way to balance the budget. We will always be in debt. So while we're having these so-called austerity measures being played out in front of us, while education is becoming far too expensive for most working class people to be able to send their kids off to university, while our social services are being cut, systems are being privatized, and you're wondering how you're going to keep a roof over your head or a job and put food on the table for your family, we are paying debt. To who? This is the one question. The one question when they talk about the debt and the need to cut social services and increase your taxes, why are we doing that? Because we're in debt. To who? Who do we owe the money to exactly? Do we ever think about that? Who do we owe the money to? I'll tell you who we owe the money to. The Rothschilds, the Oppenheimers, the filthy rich banksters that are running this system, that our corrupt prostitute politicians gave the power to these tyrants to do. You all have not worked hard enough. None of you have worked hard enough. None of you working class people out there have worked hard enough. You haven't worked hard enough and you owe the Rothschilds money. And they're taking away your social services and they're telling you you need to go fight a war in Iran now in Syria. And what do they do with the war? They make money off of us, again. And they send our sons and daughters off to war to kill innocent people, to rape them, to steal their land. And all the while, with hypocrisy doesn't even begin to explain us talking about freedom and democracy. It is a joke, and it mocks all of us. And the head of the snake is the financial system. And Henry Ford rightly said, it's a good thing that people don't understand the financial system because if they did, there will probably be a revolution by the morning. And it's true. We owe money to the filthy rich. That's who we're in debt to. They could, they could say, we're going to wipe the debt clean. For me, that wouldn't be enough. Are you kidding me? You think you're going to get off that easy? For hundreds of years, you've been enslaving the people in your debt-driven system. And you think that you're just going to be able to wipe the slate clean and that's going to be it? Hell no. If you don't hang from a lap post, you should consider yourself lucky for the scam that you have perpetrated on the people. And the thing is, is that they've got us all by this system. They control the money. It's not even paper to them. They don't even need to print the money. They can simply go into a computer, type in a couple extra zeros in an account, and someone has got money. And this system that we're fighting against, you know, I've been working on things, and the, the thing that is one of the greatest challenges of trying to get things done is you need money. Well, guess what? Who are we fighting? Who we're fighting has an infinite supply of money. So we're forever fighting against people who can pay every corrupt person who can be bought. And that actually explains everything about the world and the way it functions. Our world is run by corrupt prostitutes because those that can be bought are the ones that will be given the positions of power. And ideally, we like corrupt people who like little boys or high-class prostitutes, and we like to have videotapes of them because if you ever think to do what's right, then we'll release those videos of you with some little boy or some prostitute. Literally, the more corrupt you are, the more qualified you are to be a prime minister or a president. Literally, this is the system we live in. It rewards the corrupt, and it punishes those people who actually have some integrity. That is the system, and the head of the snake is the financial system. And until we change that system, we are fighting an uphill battle. And let's make no mistake as well. The only way that I could get up here and say these things is that I have no fear. I have no fear of death, nor of torture, or of murder. None of that stuff. Because first off, that's another illusion anyway, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I'm not a Muslim. However, I have been called a Muslim by many, many of Muslims. I understand the principles within Islam with regard to justice and how we deal with injustice. Three ways, three ways. You know it, I know it. And how many of us are applying one of those three ways? And how many of us are applying the most serious way, which is to confront injustice head on, fearlessly, willing to pay any price? 
And one of the people that helped me wake up in America was a brother who I love as much as I love any man who ever lived, a Muslim, Brother Malcolm X. Brother Malcolm X was supposed to be another statistic. Brother Malcolm went through hell. He was cheated. He was violated by that American system, that racist American system, regardless of its token black president. That system has made victims of black people for hundreds of years and never so much as apologized for what it's done to black people. Even in the last couple of weeks, another young black kid, 17 years old, shot dead in the police, don't even investigate it. This happens all the time in America. Brother Malcolm managed through Islam. That was definitely his saving grace, Islam. It taught him the meaning of justice. And although he didn't understand true Islam while he was following the so-called Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, eventually he broke free from the Nation of Islam. And he went on a Hajj. And after he went on his Hajj, and he visited world leaders, he visited the leaders in Africa, and he said very famously that he sat at the table with Muslims whose skin was white. But at that time, he realized that this color of the skin meant nothing, that they were brothers and sisters, not just in Islam, but in humanity. And he felt that maybe if it could do that for non-American Muslims, maybe Islam could do that as well for white Americans. And I happen to agree that when Islam is taken correctly, based on what I understand of it, it is the most noble religion, one that I have the greatest of respect for, and whom I have so many friends who practice. And having spent time in Muslim lands, having met countless Muslims, I can say that I consider more than anything else for each one of them to be my brothers and sisters. And that is also... <laughs> And this brings me to what I believe is one of the great tracks as well, that Muslims fall into, Christians fall into it, other people fall into it, is this insanity of continuing to look at ourselves in terms of the group that we identify with. This is a trap. Now, I don't know how many of you will disagree with me, but I don't believe that this world is ever going to be 100% Muslims. Nor do I happen to think that that would be necessarily a good thing. I have a tremendous amount of respect for non-Muslims as well. There are many people out there who practice spiritual beliefs that are not offensive at all. In fact, I see many virtuous qualities to many of the ways that people express their love for God and for all the creation. So I don't believe that there is anything wrong with diversity. In fact, I see it as one of our great challenges to love and respect each other for our differences to the point that you respect me as a brother. When you step on my toes or violate a brother or sister of mine, that is where my respect for you ends. And I don't care whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Jew or an atheist or whatever you are, when you step on the rights of my brother or sister, you have put yourself into a category of enemy. You cannot do that. And the way that the powers that be are able to continue to dominate us is because we continue to put ourselves in this group or that group. Socialist, communist, anarchist, Muslim, Christian. We are brothers and sisters in one human family. Granted, many of our brothers and sisters do not know the meaning of humanity and sold their soul to the devil long ago. And many of them will never turn back. And God help them when humanity does unite. If there is no mercy amongst humanity, God help you, because if you get what you've been doling out to humanity, if you hang from a lamp post, you'll be lucky. If you don't rot in a dungeon like many of our Muslim brothers and sisters who are rotting away, like for instance, Sister Hana Shalabi, now day 41 or something, on a hunger strike in administrative detention. What is administrative detention? This is locking people away with no due process, no human rights, with no assurance as to when you'll be let out, forever rotting away, never knowing if you're going to get out. How many people rotted away in Guantanamo with no rights? And one of the good things I see is that recently in America, a law was passed, NDAA. This traitorous bill, which the traitorous treasonous US Congress passed, <laughs> actually allows for the first time for American citizens to be treated as we've been treating 
other people around the world, in particular Muslims and Arabs. I.e., we can, according to the U.S. treasonous laws that now exist, Americans can be put away indefinitely with no due process and also brought away in a dungeon. I don't think they'll do that. I think they're just trying to scare the good white folk into not doing what's right. But I'm actually happy to see that it's there because it really is a wake-up call. And I don't know if that's what it takes for my white brothers and sisters in the Western world to wake up and realize what's being doled out to other people or not. But if it is, good. And actually, I hope that they do put some people away, some white people away. Perhaps they'll do it to me. I know for a fact that when you stand up and say what's right and what's true, that you will pay a price. But I have to say, if I were Muslim or Arab and have done what I've done, I would have been in prison long ago. I probably would have been killed by now. And the only reason why I'm getting away with this is because I'm white and I was born in America. And I can articulate the language of America, of England, quite well. And I put on record where I'm coming from. And some of the things that I stand for, and I believe we must understand if we're serious, the lies. The biggest one in modern history, 9-11. What a force. How incredible is it that anyone in their right mind would buy this ridiculous version that all these so-called experts in the mainstream media are telling us? That Osama bin Laden and 19 hijackers, five of which are verified to be alive to this day, that these guys were responsible for this act, including Mohammed Atta. Who knows Mohammed Atta, who he is? the lead hijacker of 9-11, supposedly. Mohammed Atta, this is not me making this up, this is a fact. Mohammed Atta was snorting cocaine and drinking booze in strip joints in Florida. That's Mohammed Atta, the lead hijacker. One day snorting cocaine and drinking booze and having sex with strippers. The next day flying a jihad, a jihadic mission. Are you serious? Is this some sort of bad movie? Is this serious? And what does it say about us that we could believe for one second this ridiculous version of what happened on 9-11? What has happened as a result of 9-11? Well, let's go back before 9-11, first off. If we pay attention, we will know something about the motive for 9-11 and the plan that was laid out before 9-11. Very famously, the Project for a New American Century comprised of so-called neocons, the Wolfowitzes and all of these tyrannical, I want to use stronger language, forgive me. If I didn't have a Muslim audience, I'd already used strong words by now. These people called neocons. These people laid out a plan. In the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, they argued that America found itself now in a unique position in the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the fall of the Soviet <laughs> Empire, they argued that America should take advantage of this position, that it should achieve a goal of full spectrum dominance. Full spectrum dominance is an agenda to which America would, can, would maintain and create control over air, land, sea, and space. Total dominance of the seas, total dominance over the air, total dominance on the land, and even total dominance in space, with space-based nuclear weapons that could be launched anywhere, instantly. So what is America? What have they done? Well, they've achieved a lot of these goals to a great degree. Now, the way that they argued in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet empire to be able to achieve this goal is that we would have to carry out wars of aggression and occupations to be able to secure certain strategic advantages. Now keep in mind, this is all before 9-11. All of this is before 9-11. So what would we have to do? Well, we would have to secure the stupendous amount of energy reserves in the former Soviet republics, Turkmenistan and these areas. The former Soviet republics or the Soviet republics in that region have stupendous amounts of gas and natural reserves of oil as well. Now in order to transport this gas and oil to the world, they would need to build a pipeline through Afghanistan. Now, in order to do that, they'd have to make sure that they'd have compliance from the government there. And make no mistake, the U.S. government was dealing with the Taliban for several years until they reached a point where they decided, because does America have a problem dealing with tyrants? How stupid are we to think that? Who is Saddam Hussein? 
But do we not know who Saddam Hussein was? We helped coddle Saddam Hussein and bring him to power. We protected him. We provided him with military power. We provided him with political support, economic support, agricultural support. Iraq was a favored nation trading ally. He was gassing Kurds and we continued this relationship with him. He was torturing people, killing people. He was a tyrant from day one. We had no problem with that. In fact, we gave him the weapons to fight one of our wars against Iran. The only nation in that region that wasn't a puppet, really. After they shook off our puppet, the Shah of Iran, America was angry and upset because they didn't get their way. You had the Islamic Republic that was basically an affront to the American Empire. So Saddam went and fought our little war and killed probably a million Iranians and however many hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Saddam did all that for us. So I, I don't understand people who then glorify Saddam Hussein because later on he dealt with the devil. He dealt directly with the devil and benefited from the devil. So if he then got a little upset because the devil wasn't a very good friend, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for that. So Saddam Hussein was fine for us. The Taliban were fine for us as well. Perfectly fine. We were happy to do business with the Taliban. And if you know anything about Afghanistan anyway, compared to the Northern Alliance, the Taliban ain't all that bad. But you saying the Northern Alliance aren't vicious? <laughs> I think you need to relook at the reality. They're just as bloodthirsty, if not even more so. So we had no problem with the Taliban, but we concluded that they weren't reliable. That was the conclusion. It was, we didn't care about human rights or women's rights or anything. Come on. We, were, we concluded that the Taliban were not reliable. But the agenda was to take control of Afghanistan, to build that pipeline, and to control those energy reserves. Because if we want to achieve full spectrum dominance, we need to be able to control those en energy reserves. It gives us veto power over the world. If we control the oil, we control the gas reserves, plus the tremendous amounts of mineral deposits in Afghanistan, which were well known back then as well. Afghanistan is a hugely important nation in terms of this full spectrum dominance agenda. So that agenda was laid out. The Taliban were not reliable. Another key piece of the puzzle in this full spectrum dominance agenda was Iraq. Second largest oil reserves, an important region. We wanted to build permanent military bases in the region. So how would we be able to affect this goal? Since we uh, ended our friendly relationship with Saddam and he was no longer compliant and bending over for us as we expect of all of our puppets, uh, we needed to take control of Iraq. Now, they said in their position paper, rebuilding America's defenses in this agenda of taking over the world, they said very openly that in order to achieve these goals, we'd have to invade Afghanistan, we'd have to invade Iraq, that would obviously be a huge loss of life. This would be very unpopular. The American people are too stupid to appreciate the wisdom of this plan, so we won't be able to get them to support this plan. Barring a, quote, new Pearl Harbor type of event. They actually said this before 9-11. Barring a, quote, new Pearl Harbor event, we won't be able to get the stupid people to do what we want to do. Because the stupid people won't support us when our bloodthirsty wars and going and killing a bunch of people so we can secure the energy reserves. They won't support it. And they're right. They wouldn't support it. And if we go back in history a little bit, actually, if we look at the so-called great wars, World War I and World War II, nothing but manipulation again. Nothing but manipulation. In World War I, the American people had it quite good. America was doing quite fine, thank you very much. The Europeans have been fighting these bloody wars for centuries. For centuries. And most Americans thought, let them fight it out. We don't need this. And at that time, there was actually still a strong element within American society that did not want to be an empire. Keep in mind that before World War I, America wasn't quite an empire yet. They had made some moves. They'd taken over Hawaii, Puerto Rico, the Philippines. They had started to make moves to expand the empire. But before that, there was actually an argument. And there was a strong element within America that said, no, we do not want to be the next empire, the continuation of the British Empire, the most tyrannical empire of all, if you ask me. And this element was still there. So during World War I, the American people wanted no part of it. They didn't. But they got sucked into it with the sinking of the Lusitania. The Lusitania, this huge ship that was sent into waters that we knew had German U-boats. And it was sunk, it had a lot of Americans on it, and bam! 
Now the American people are upset. They're angry, they want blood, and they're ready. That is how we entered World War I. World War II is even more stark. Oh my God, the Americans said to myself, they're doing it again. World War II kicks off. The Europeans are at it again. And the American people once again said, we don't need this. We don't want this. Let them fight it out. And then what happened? Pearl Harbor. What a gift. Pearl Harbor. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I'm not making this up. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the President of the United States, knew that the Japanese fleet was coming to Pearl Harbor. What did he do? He got rid of the newer ships, got them out of the harbor, and he put a bunch of older ships into the harbor and made sure that America would incur maximum casualties on the day of Pearl Harbor. Why did he do that? So that the American people would once again be manipulated into yet another horrific event that would make them out for blood, and there we go again, into World War II, the Great War, the Noble War. Just another manipulation so us, the cannon fodder, can go off and fight yet another war where the banksters are supporting all sides. Here's another fact for you. I'm not making this up. Go check it. The Bush family, the equivalent of the American royal family. Prescott Bush. Does anybody know about Prescott Bush? Grandpappy Bush. The grandfather of the last Bush president. Prescott Bush was a member, the chairman of, of the Union Bank. This bank was financing the Nazis before, during, and even after America entered the war, an American bank with a Bush family member at the head of it, was financing the Nazi war machine. After Americans entered the war, and American sons and daughters were off fighting the so-called Great War. Not only that, but an American company, Union Oil, was providing an essential ingredient to the Nazis to be able to fly their planes. They could not carry out their operations with their Air Force without Union Oil providing them with essential ingredients. This is a fact. The banksters who are behind all of this stuff finance each side of the war. They do this every time. We're being manipulated. Libya, Libya had no debt. It didn't have a Rothschild controlled bank. It didn't. It does now. It's happening now. Getting their way in there now. Of course, you know they got their grubby hands all over that oil and they're gonna do everything they can to get it, and they'll work with so-called Al-Qaeda. Where does Al-Qaeda and the CIA end? They're one and the same. And these dupe idiots who think they're working for Al-Qaeda, you're pawns, you're idiots. You work for the CIA, and you don't even know it. Come on. It's one manipulation after another. So these people, these neocons, these criminals, they said before 9-11, Barring a, quote, new Pearl Harbor type of event, the stupid people won't support a war. And lo and behold, there came 9-11. What a gift. What a gift. And what happened after 9-11? Let's recount the facts. First off, Osama bin Laden came out and said, I didn't do this. That's what he said. He couldn't have done it anyway, but nonetheless, he said that. Now, all these ridiculous videos that Al Jazeera managed to get their hands on that came out after the fact, which are completely debunked on any serious level, where he said he did it and whatnot, is ridiculous. It's more manipulation. But Osama bin Laden said he didn't do it. But not only that, here we are, over 10 years later, does anybody know how many actual cases were brought to court to bring Osama bin Laden and the 19 hijackers to justice? How many? Zero. Not a one. So uh, I'm sorry. The media is telling us that 9-11 was carried out by Osama bin Laden and 19 hijackers. There's no debate about this. There's been a big commission about it, all this kind of stuff. Yet, not one case, one charge has been filed against Osama bin Laden or the 19 hijackers. How is that possible? Not only that, but in the aftermath of 9-11, when we were preparing to invade Afghanistan, the Taliban said very clearly, look, if you hand us evidence 
to support the charges against Osama bin Laden, we'll hand him over. What did America do? <laughs> they didn't hand over anything because there is no evidence. There is no evidence. Not only is there no evidence to support that Osama bin Laden did this, there's tons of evidence as to who did it. So who did it? Well, I'll tell you, we know for a fact some of the people who did it. We know for a fact that Mossad agents of Israel were in New York on the day, and they were sent there on the day to film the event. How do I know this? Am I some super uh, journalist? You know, it's got contacts in it. No, they admitted it on Israeli television. They admitted on Israeli television in Tel Aviv that they were sent by Mossad to film the event. Now, how did they know to film the event if Mossad didn't at least have foreknowledge? How would they know that? I didn't know it. Did you get a memo? I didn't get the memo. But they got it. Not only that, do you know how many people were arrested on the day, or better yet, do you know what nation the people who were arrested on 9-11 and the days afterward, do you know where they were from? Take one guess. Israel. That's the only people who were arrested. Why were they arrested? Well, the ones I've already told you about were arrested because they were high-fiving each other, celebrating, laughing as they were filming the events when people thought, well, that's kind of strange. So they called the police and they arrested them. Not only that, there were Israelis that were arrested, running away from a van that blew up. It had explosives in it, and it blew up. And they caught the guys who ran away from the van. They were Israeli. Not only that, there were reports going around on 9-11. They got anonymous calls. The police got anonymous calls. We've seen a suspicious van with people, and this quote, people who look Palestinian. The police on 9-11 got reports that supposedly, how do you, what does a Palestinian look like, by the way? I'm sorry, but, you know, I've met many of Palestinians, and I've met many uh, Libyans and uh, Lebanese, and I don't know how you tell the difference between a Palestinian. Uh, I don't know unless they're willing, I, I'm, an, I'm a Palestinian or something, t-shirt. I can't tell a Palestinian from many of you. My children are Palestinian, by the way. And my son looks like me, so I don't know how you'd know he was Palestinian. So they get these anonymous reports. Palestinian looking people look really suspicious. They pulled over a van that fit the description that was given, and they arrested these people. What nation were they from? Israel. Guess what they found in the van? Explosives. So, so here's the plan. They just didn't quite manage to do it right. First we make the call, we get all these anonymous calls in, oh, Palestinians, oh, suspicious. They then find the van, or they find the, the residue, or the remainder of the van after it blows up, and that's what's gonna be reported. The problem was that they caught Israelis, so they couldn't, they couldn't say that. Now we all know, well, most of us, or some of us at least know, that on the day there was all this footage of supposedly Palestinians jumping up and down and celebrating that was, that was not true. This footage was old footage, it was not of the day, this was totally unrelated, yet this was to blame the Palestinians. Netanyahu very famously said in the direct aftermath of 9-11 what he thought about 9-11. He said, well, it's good for Israel. That's what he, and yeah, it was good for Israel. It worked out really well for Israel. And they went and had their next killing spree uh, shortly after that fact. Israelis were the only ones that were arrested on that day. And this is part of the reason why I'll be a marked man for the rest of my life. It's part of the reason why I'm slandered on so many different levels. It's so, many re so much of the reason why you know, I can't expect to live a long life. Uh, inshallah, I will. But till the day I die, I will continue to say what's true because we are not playing a game here. Whether I live or not is not the issue. The issue is, especially if we're parents, how can we look ourselves in the mirror and respect ourselves when our world is being destroyed right before our eyes? And our children are the ones that are going to inherit this world. I believe personally that if we have any responsibility as a parent, it is to hand this world over in a better state than we inherited it. And I'm sorry, but my parents and my grandparents and successive generations before have failed continuously 
And we can make excuses all we want, but at the end of the day, the world that we have inherited is this way because we have failed. And now we sit here on the verge of a third world war, literally flirting with the end of the world as we know it. And this is being played out right before our eyes. And if we want to see the truth, if we want to understand the truth, we can see it. It's there. It's staring us right in the face. And we don't do it. At least not enough of us have done it yet. We must do this. 9-11 is the ultimate inside job. Now, I could go on and on about 9-11, but I'll talk about it just a little bit more. How stupid are we to believe, first off, the whole story is ridiculous, but three buildings, never before in the history of our world, have steel frame buildings fallen over because of a fire. Never before, never since. Not only did three buildings fall, two of which which were hit by jets, we know that, Supposedly melted steel and pancaking and all this ridiculous rubbish caused these buildings to fall at nearly free fall speed and pulverized into dust. Now I happen to know somebody who was in the Twin Towers on the day of 9-11. His name is William Rodriguez. Another man, just a normal man, just a decent man, somebody who's not willing to sell his soul for any price. He worked in the World Trade Center uh, complex in the Twin Towers for 19 years. He was a janitor. On the day of 9-11, he was in the basement and he heard a massive explosion from below. The first explosion he heard was from below. Then he heard a second explosion from above. They got the timing a little off there. It's supposed to be the top explosion first. The first explosion caused one of his colleagues who had been down in one of the basement levels, he was all bloodied and he came up and he was nearly dead. And then they heard the second explosion this guy had one of two sets of master keys for the Twin Towers. The master keys allowed him to be able to open up all sorts of doors and passageways. He worked in the building buildings for 19 years, so the people that were up in the top levels were his friends. I mean, you know, he had relationships with these people, and he knew with these keys he might be able to help them, so what did he do? He literally went up into the building, up and down twice. He saved a bunch of people's lives. Now, while he was in the buildings, he heard what police heard, what firemen, first responders heard, what people in the buildings who survived heard, he heard multiple explosions in the buildings. You can hear the explosions. There are videos on YouTube. You can watch the videos, hear the explosions in the buildings. He heard multiple explosions. He went up into the building. He saved a bunch of people's lives. On the second trip down, he was coming out of the building, and the, the firemen literally yelled to him, run, run because the building had started to come down. And he looked up, he saw it, and he ran and jumped underneath the fire truck. He got into that fire truck, the building came down and literally buried him. He was buried under the debris. I mean, if you don't believe in God, this, this really challenges you. The guy survived. The only reason why he survived was because the tires of that truck didn't uh, pop, didn't deflate. If, he, if that would have happened, he would have been buried, and that would have been it. But he survived. He came out alive, he was invited to the White House, he met George Bush on at least two different occasions, met Hillary Clinton and all these other prostitutes. And, and he was a hero. He was a hero. He was treated as a hero. And, you know, he was told, listen, we're gonna send you this school. This school is like a vetting school. And once you go to this school and we make sure that you're right for us, i.e. we know we can control you, uh, then you're going to run for office, you're going to be a mayor, you're going to be a governor, you're going to be rich, you're a hero. He said, great, fantastic. But he kept talking, just honestly, about what happened. And <laughs> he, so he kept repeating, explosions at the buildings, what's that all about? How do you explain that? At a certain point, they sat him down and they said, listen, William, you're going to go to this school. You're going to go through this school. You're going to run for office. You're going to be a respected leader. You're going to be rich. You're a hero. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. What did he do? He refused. Where is he now? <laughs> well, he doesn't have a bunch of money, and he's no longer called a hero anymore. 
And all he has is his integrity, and he exercises in, in his integrity by speaking the truth about what he saw that day. Now, William Rodriguez provided testimony to the so-called 9-11 Commission report, the 9-11 Whitewash report. And his testimony is noticeably stricken from the record, along with many others, including first responders, many of whom are dying now from all the toxic stuff that was in the air that they were breathing in while they were trying to rescue people. His testimony is taken out. Now, the two buildings, it's really an indictment of the stupidity of people that we could have bought for a second that those buildings could fall as they have, because it defies the laws of physics. Melt it. Steel cannot melt from jet fuel, and even if it did melt, it wouldn't fall at free fall speed as it did and be pulverized into dust. Never mind the fact that nanothermite has been found in the residues. Never mind the fact that molten steel was coming out of the buildings. Why is molten steel? Jet fuel cannot make steel melt. It's not hot enough. Basic physics tells you this. We understand this. We know the, heated, the temperature at which steel will melt. Not only that, but those buildings were designed to take impacts from jets of that size and bigger. And again, never has a building fallen from a fire. There's a building in Spain that burned for much longer, much hotter, and all that was left is the shell of the steel because steel does not melt from fire. Flat out. But not only do we have these two buildings that fell and were pulverized into their own footprint, there was, what, you know, it wasn't even... But couple stories high, three stories high. How do you take a building that high and compact it into nothing? Molten steel was in the, in the basement areas for months. Molten, how did that happen? How did molten steel get into the basement? Ridiculous. But not only that, building seven, a 48-story building, wasn't even hit. It wasn't even hit. Building 7. You know what was in Building 7? Financial records for the banksters, the fraudsters, conveniently gone. How nice is that? So, how convenient. Building 7 falls down as well. 9-11 is what's called a false flag operation. 9-11 was the, quote, new Pearl Harbor event that was used as the excuse to justify this farcical war on terror, which has now resulted in the death of probably a million and a half Iraqis, millions of orphans, millions of refugees, a country laid waste with prostitutes now governing that nation, and sectarian divide, oh so carefully instigated by the powers that be, including the British. While I'm on that note, let me give some of my scorn to the British Empire as well, which continues through its proxy America and its good friend in Israel. Does anybody remember a story a few years back about the two, the two special forces, SAS special forces guys who were caught in Iraq? Two British special forces guys were caught in Iraq, but they weren't just caught in Iraq. They were caught in Iraq driving a car in Basra in Arab costume, let's get this straight, British SAS, wearing British costume, meant to look like you, like Muslims, right? With explosives in their car. Now, hazard a guess. Why do you think British SAS is running around Basra with Arab costume with explosives in their car? Are they on some sort of winning the hearts and minds mission? What exactly are they doing how stupid are we that we don't know this? They're carrying out more such false flag events, sowing the seeds of sectarian divide, so that you all, Sunni and Shia, can fight each other. Because we couldn't possibly control you if you actually united and treated each other as brothers and sisters. No, no. You have to fight each other. And if you don't do it naturally, we're going to help you out a little bit. We'll blow up some mosques as well. Oh, the Sunnis did it. Oh, the Shia did it. We did it. The British did it. The Americans are doing it. Israeli Mossad are doing it. The car bombings have Israeli Mossad written all over them. The Israelis are masters at car bombing, and they do it all the time. This is what's happening, and we're being manipulated. So what can we do? <laughs> I can 
talked about 9-11. I, I'm sorry, I don't script things, you know. I, I always just, what feels right, that's what I say. <coughs> well, I believe we can do a lot. First off, we need to shed the fear. A person who is fearful is a person who can be controlled. A person who is not afraid to die cannot be controlled. A person who is independent or answers only to God cannot be controlled either. I don't answer to anyone but myself, and I have a relationship with God. I respect all that God has created. I respect all my brothers and sisters, which are part of God's creation, to the point that they're not violating me or my other brothers and sisters. I respect this beautiful world that we've been given. While we sit here and pollute it and destroy it and allow ourselves to be pitted against each other, I respect it, and therefore I'm prepared for whatever price comes my way, and I know that when I meet my maker, I honestly feel like what's going to happen, if that indeed is what happens, and you get a chance to stand before your maker, I'm going to look God square in the eyes, and I'm going to just laugh and say, I did my best. It is crazy down there. It is absolutely crazy down there. I mean, I don't know what the hell happened and where, but... Too many of my brothers and sisters are crazy. They're nuts. They don't get it, and yet there are so many beautiful people out there. So many, and I've met many of them. That will bring me to Palestine. The Palestinian people have been going through hell. Hell. And their Arab and Muslim brothers and sisters in their neighboring lands have largely left them to rot in this pit of Zionist hell with corrupt dictators, Mubarak and all the rest of them, sold out dictators, and the only ones that didn't sell out completely, well, where do they find themselves? I'm not going to defend anyone who violates my brothers and sisters with torture, imprisonment, and things like that, but I have to say, if we look at Syria, how dare we have any pretense for concern for the Syrian people, and how dare we ignore the fact that there is, in fact, significant amounts of outside interference to destabilize that country because the Greater Israel Project requires the destabilization of the surrounding nations so that the Greater Israel Project, which intends to be the expansion of current Israel, so that it will become the new empire and dominate the world. That is the project. And part of that process is destabilizing the Arab nations. So we all know that Syria is one of the only nations in that region, other than Lebanon and Hezbollah. I mean, us, not you know, the other side of the power structure in Lebanon is quite happy to do business with the empire. Hezbollah clearly is not, and they kicked the butt of the Israelis more than once, so respect to them. They have fought the Israelis, and they have not turned away. They give some honor to the Muslims. They give honor to Arabs. They're not puppets. And that's Syria as well, not puppets. Now, I'm not going to forgive the Syrian regime for its excesses and its violations against the people. There is legitimate dissent. But that is not what's happening in Syria. One of the few places where you don't have a puppet and we're doing everything we can to destroy that land. The Palestinians have been dealing with this hell for decades. And what amazes me about the Palestinians, really amazes me, is that if you put the American people, if you put the American people or the British people if we reverse the situation, and you put the American and the British people through that kind of occupation, treated that way for that long, how do you think the British people would be after decades of that type of treatment? How do you think they'd be? How do you think the American people, that's a violent nation, as is. Violent, incredible violence. How do you think they'd be if they were subjected to that kind of occupation? Oh my God, would the blood be spilling. And Americans would be slaughtering Americans who were collaborating with the enemy in a heartbeat. They would be spilling their American brothers and sisters' blood if they collaborated with the enemy. The Palestinians have been dealing with this for decades. And what is so remarkable about the Palestinians, I was just in Gaza for six months last year. I walked the streets of Gaza on my own. At night, late, I walked the streets. How is it possible? I'm an ex-Marine. <laughs> I'm tattooed. I'm obviously not. 
of Arab descent. I am walking the streets of Gaza. Again, let's reverse the situation. If America had been through that sort of thing, or Britain had through, been through that sort of thing, and you wanted to go down uh, some dark-skinned person, obviously from a Western nation, very likely supporting the oppression of your people, do you think you could walk the streets of England or America, as I have done? Fuck, good luck to you. Now, I'm not condemning the Iraqi people, but I wouldn't walk the streets of Baghdad right now. No way. I'm not going to do it. No. I'm not afraid of death, but I'm not going to do something stupid. You know? Now, I can understand that, because if I were from Palestine, if I were from Iraq, and I saw my brothers and sisters, if I saw my wife or my children being violated in the most obscene of ways, would I sit by? I would rather die. I would much prefer to die then sit by and do nothing. And what happens to the man that does nothing? What did that do to your soul? How would that make you feel about yourself? When your brothers and sisters, your women, are being raped and murdered, your children are being blown to bits, and you don't do anything? Or worse, you work with the enemy? No, absolutely not. So I don't condemn those that fight. You have a right. I subscribe to... Islamic teachings in this regard as well. There are two kinds of war. A just war and an unjust war. Everything the West is doing unjust. Everything. Totally unjust. The people in Iraq, Afghanistan, and any occupied land, Palestine, have every right to fight back. Every right to fight back. <coughs> with every means at their disposal. How dare we point the finger at them and say they're the terrorists. We in the West are the ultimate terrorists, and the United States, my birth nation, without question, is the greatest terrorist of the 20th and 21st century, hands down. But there is no separation between the United States and Britain, which makes Britain the greatest terrorist as well. And this alliance between Israel, Britain, and America is the true axis of evil. Disgusting, horrific tyrants who put no value on life and are using us mocking us. Unacceptable. So. We, first thing, I believe the key to a better world is a three-step process in the shortest terms. I resent it when people talk about peace. Peace without justice is peace not worth having. Forget that. I prefer to die in a fight than to be at peace at the end of a barrel of a gun. Forget it. No justice, no peace. The first step to a better world is the truth. I believe, as Jesus said, as it says throughout the Quran, the truth. The truth is God's word. The truth. We must understand the truth. We must see through the lies. I can't tell you anyway. It's not my job to tell you. I can share with you my understanding. But at the end of the day, none of that is going to mean anything unless you decide for yourself that I'm going to face the truth and I'm going to take in the truth. And once you understand the truth, then we get to the next step, justice. There is no way that we can affect justice without understanding of the truth. The first step is the truth. And that's why the powers that be have their mainstream media prostitutes perpetuating all of these lies. They must keep us stupid. They must divide us. They must use lies to divide us to, in order to maintain control over us. And this is the beauty of the internet. While some people are wasting their time on all sorts of rubbish, many people are using the internet to access information and understand the truth and bypass the filter of the propaganda machine. And this is an important and powerful thing. The truth, step number one, justice, and I don't mean vengeance. I, for one, would be happy to support an amnesty period, maybe a year. Declare, from this point, for a year, if you have been in a position of power, George Bush, Tony Blair, any of these other power-mongering criminals, if you come clean, if you come clean, because we already know the truth anyway, we know you were lying. We know you're reading the script. We know you're a puppet. 
So don't you dare tell us, oh, I was wrong. You weren't wrong. You did what you were told. If you come clean and admit your crimes, I would be, for one, happy to provide amnesty. Of course, it's not up to me, but I would support that. I would support that. You better come clean. If you don't come clean, then you should deal with the same kind of torture, imprisonment, and death that you've doled out to others. If it's not good enough for you to just be honest, then the, me then the justice that you meted out, or injustice you meted out on others, shall be dealt upon you. But you have a chance. I don't want vengeance. And I can even, for me, I can forgive. I can. But it's not up to me to forgive, for instance, for the Samuni family who I have pictures up there of. The Samuni family who were herded into a house, 97 family members told by the Israelis during Operation Cast Lead to go into a house and then have that house bombed by the Israelis. 22 family members, dead. Blood, guts, limbs, dead. All packed into a room about the size of the first half of this, smaller than that, 97 family members. Imagine a rocket coming into the building, then another rocket coming into the building. Imagine, imagine some of your family members decapitated, your bowels, blood, now imagine, now imagine that you're denied medical attention and, and water and food and heat in the middle of the winter for four days. Four days. Imagine lying next to the corpse of your child for four days. Imagine your child lying next to your corpse for four days. Some of you dying over the course of that four days because you're not allowed any medical attention. I've asked the Samuni family, do you think that you could forgive? I've asked others in Palestine who have been through similar crimes. And to be honest, most of them have said no. You can't forgive that. It wasn't an accident. It was intentional. So I understand this. I understand this. But I do believe in the capacity of forgiveness, or at the very least, I believe that our sense of justice can overrule our desire for vengeance. <coughs> I don't wish harm nor foul towards anyone, but I understand completely well that those who are violating our brothers and sisters should not expect mercy when the, when the power shift occurs, and I do believe it's going to occur. And the major, major obstacle to us achieving the goal of justice is seeing each other as brothers and sisters. I may not be a Muslim, but I'm your brother. And I will stand with all of my brothers and sisters of right mind who seek a better world. I don't care what religion you practice or even if you practice any religion at all. All I care about is that you treat my fellow human beings and myself with respect, and I in turn will treat you as I would wish to be treated. This is not a difficult concept. A child can understand this concept. can get this and we can understand that we are brothers and sisters and we do unite, we get beyond the sectarian divides that are being manipulated and we see each other as brothers and sisters, then we will find very quickly that we will liberate ourselves from this world. Now there are different theories as to what's happening this year. 2012 in the eyes of many is the end of the world and there are different ideas as to what is going to happen. It could mean the end of the world, i.e a global nuclear war, and literally the end of all life as we know it, fire and brimstone, all of that hell on earth. We could. We've come close on more than one occasion, so I agree that's very possible. But there's also another possibility. It's the idea that it is the end of the world as we know it, i.e. this collective insanity that we find ourselves within, that allows us to be used and abused and exploited and enslaved that we could snap out of it, see the truth, act on the truth, and affect justice and create a better world based on truth and justice. Now in this world, you don't have to worry about losing your job. You don't have to worry about your children not being able to get an education. You don't have to worry about your children having to be sent off to some war. In this world, we can actually have what we all seek, if we're sane, to be able to provide food for our families, to put a roof over our head, 
to be able to exercise our life and our liberty free of coercion, free of fear, to live a dignified life. We all can understand this. Unless you're crazy, we can understand this. <coughs> there are billions of us on this planet. The vast majority of those billions of people can understand these concepts. And the only thing standing in our way is getting beyond these ridiculous, farcical groupings that we have allowed ourselves to get into, putting more attention and more worth on the value of our group, even if it means at the expense of others. Whether it's our nation, our national interest, our race, our religion, if we can't get beyond that, then quite frankly, I don't think we even deserve to have a place on this planet. All the other life that's here manages, manage to live in harmony for so long, and here we come. Supposedly, God's creation, the epitome of God's creation, and what are we doing? Destroying God's creation. We are an affront to God if we continue to act this way. And, I mean, <laughs> I know. I know it doesn't need to be this way. I know it's possible. I know because I was stupid. I was an idiot. I bought the lies. And if I <coughs> can snap out of it, I'm convinced other people can snap out of it. And it isn't complicated. It's not Children get this and we drum it out of them. We indoctrinate them into a set of beliefs that makes them just as stupid as we have become. One last thing, yeah? You don't go from tyranny to a better world in one giant leap. It doesn't work that way, step by step. Palestine is near and dear to my heart. I believe the way of Palestine is the way of the world. I believe if we solve the problem of Palestine, the world will also be a better place. If we fail in Palestine, then we will fail on a global level. If there was one area that I believe we should focus on, it would be Palestine. With also the understanding that the financial system needs to be understood. Palestine is begging, crying out for us to do what we're capable of doing because they cannot on their own do what is required for them to be liberated. Now, I didn't get into it. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have been slandered. I've been accused of being an adulterer, trying to lure <coughs> young women into my apartment in Gaza. I'm a thief. I'm a fraudster. I'm a terrorist operative of Hamas. I'm linked to Al-Qaeda. Uh, you name it. I've been accused of virtually everything. The whole point of this is to get people to think I'm not the guy I say that I am, that I don't actually care, that I'm in this for money and fame and all this kind of stuff. All I can say is, if you haven't confronted the systems of power head on, you can confront them, but if you're not making any headway, they can ignore you, they'll ignore you. you know, if, if you're not a problem to them, they'll ignore you. I guess the reward for someone like me is the more successful I am, the more I'm a target. That's the bottom line. So. I should actually be quite happy with being accused of all these things because it means I must be doing something of value. Now probably the thing that made me more hated than anything else is my experience on the Mavi Marmara. I'm sure all of you, surely you all know about the Mavi Marmara, the ship that was attacked by the Israelis on its way to Gaza. The Israelis went ballistic and killed nine people. I was on that ship and only by the grace of God did I survive on that night because what happened was I ended up being involved in disarming two Israeli commandos. Uh, one, I took the 9mm pistol off the commando. I later separated the bullets. I could have killed that commando right then and there. I could have killed him right there. I know how to use a weapon. I could have easily killed him right then and there. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't. If I had to, to defend myself, I would do it. But I did not have to, so I did not do that. I took that weapon away. Later on, I was on BBC Hard Talk. I've been on there twice. How I managed to even get on there, I don't know. I guess they thought they could try and make me look like some radical, crazy guy, and it didn't quite work out as they had planned. And, and ultimately, I called the Israelis what they are, cowards. Cowards. You're cowards. I saw those commandos. We disarmed them. We had three of them. We disarmed them, and they were taken inside the ship. 
and they were surrounded by over a hundred men. I tell you, I, I purposely walked up and looked at all three of them. Of course, I saw them when I was close up taking one of the weapons off them as well. And when they were taken into that ship, all their weapons off, and then you know what they looked like? Like little frightened children. They were crying. They looked like little babies, like daddy was coming to beat them, and they were scared to death. They thought we were going to do to them what they were doing to us. And what were they doing to us? Executing people. Executing good people. And they thought we were going to do that to them. And what did we do to them? We let them go. But when I've had the opportunity, I have said it, and I will restate it. Cowards. You're cowards. And when your weapons are taken away from you, you see what you are. Cowards. And when the situation is reversed, and you don't have all that power anymore, you will melt in the face of the Palestinians and the people of this world who have far more courage than you ever did. You're cowards. And to the day I die, I will repeat that. And if I die, <laughs> the Palestinian people have been dealing with this racist system for so long, and they have not lost their humanity. I love the Palestinian. I am a Palestinian. My heart is with Palestine. I will give my life for Palestine if necessary. And even some Palestinians can be so stupid as to buy into lies and accusations about me. And the reason why is because I will not bow to the powers that be. And I will state the truth no matter what the consequence. This brings danger to me and even potentially my family. This is the price we pay if we stand up and tell the truth in this world. So don't you be fooled by any of these bogus accusations and whatnot. The reason why they want to do that is because they do not want you to believe that you have a brother and that together we can do something meaningful. Quickly in parting, yeah? I plan on going back to Gaza. I plan on going back to Gaza in May or June. I plan on doing it in a very different way, a way that has never been done before. Part of the way that they've been able to slander me is they say that I'm doing what I'm doing for money. First off, you have to believe I'm an absolute idiot and crazy if I was doing this for money. I don't have money, any money to speak of. I have less than 100 quid in my bank account on average, and I've lived that way for a long time, only by the generosity of my family and people who believe in me through a little bit of support here and there do I manage to be able to do what I do. But I certainly don't do this for money, and I'd have to be an idiot to be doing this for money. I do this for love of justice. And one thing that I have seen in Palestine is that the people in Gaza in particular, five years into a blockade, are living on handouts. Their dignity is being stripped from them because they do not have access to raw materials. They cannot import and export. They do not have freedom of movement. And under these conditions, under these conditions in which the Israelis dictated and the Egyptians have historically collaborated with Mubarak, the Palestinians in Gaza, 80% of them are dependent on food aid to survive. Imagine what it would be to be a father or a mother and you cannot provide for your children. You have to go to the UN to get handouts to be able to put food on the table for your child. And now, also think about not being able to protect your child or your children. Because you can't. Because the Israelis bomb, as recently the last couple of weeks. You can't protect your children, you can't provide for your children. Why is that? Because those people in Gaza do not have access to the markets, the raw materials, building materials. If they were able to bring in the raw materials and export things that they produce, they could stand on their own two feet. They do not need the handouts of others. They are more than capable of taking care of themselves, but they can't because they do not have access to outside markets. This is why my focus has been trade. Furthermore, I have listened to them. And I'll tell you, the truth is, they are not asking for aid convoys. They won't say it publicly because they're grateful, they're hospitable, they're good people. But if you actually heard what they say, many of them, they're sick of the convoys. They come, we come in the convoys, and we say, oh, we broke the blockade, oh, look at how great we are, we pat ourselves on the back, we have our little holiday in Gaza, we say what great people we are, and nothing changes. Nothing changes. It's not changing things. Trade. We need to break open the door of trade. That's it. We need to break that door open, and what are we waiting for? Why aren't we doing this? My mission, which is all about this, was infiltrated, I was slandered. Money that was given to people within my movement, which is my fault as the leader. I made the mistake of trusting the wrong people. I did not have people send money to an account I controlled. I had it sent to people I trusted. 
They stole that money and then said that I took the money, which would easily be proven if they simply showed the transfers of funds or showed some proof that the money went into their accounts and then somehow got into my hands. But there is no way to prove that because it did not happen. I messed up. It was my mistake. What can I say? If any of you gave money to my mission, I am deeply sorry. But the only thing I can do now is not give up. I could give up. I could say, I blew it, I'm sorry, I could go. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back. I have a, I have a coach, full-size coach. I have people who supposedly have committed the money, but as soon as I find out that that money is committed, we're going to Gaza. But we're going in a different way. We're going with paying passengers on a commercial vessel. You're going to buy a ticket if you want to come on this trip. You're buying a ticket to Gaza. When we get to Gaza, the Palestinians are going to be able to buy a ticket. At a, Nominal, it's not about making money. It's about exercising the right to trade and commerce. And if we challenge this, if we force the Egyptians to say, no, you're not allowed, then we expose the fact that post-Mubarak, things have not changed. The Palestinians need to be able to conduct trade and commerce. Barring that, they will have to live like beggars. Now, if it's not me, it needs to be someone. And I'll be all too happy for someone to break down that wall, but I'm not going to wait, and I don't see it happening. So, if you want to do something, I didn't talk about it much, I'm sorry, but I didn't talk about it much. There are details. It's a very intelligent plan. If you want to help, then you can help by sending this mission off to Gaza. And what we are going to do is regular back and forth trips, as you would expect. If you wanted to take a coach to Germany or to Glasgow, you go and you buy a ticket and you go. Why can't the Palestinians do that? And why can't people who want to go to Palestine do that? Because we haven't made it so. And the Egyptians, God help the leadership there if they want to try and stop this. One last point on it, which is really important. Humanitarian law is a farce. It's a joke. We know this. People are killed. Nobody is held to account. Western criminals are continuously protected. Humanitarian law has failed. Trade and commerce. While we talk about boycotting, divesting, and sanctioning Israel, business is booming. In fact, the British ambassador to Israel just said this the other day in the Jerusalem Post. He was bragging about how business between Britain and Israel is booming. It's all going very well, very swimmingly. Between the EU and Israel is about 25 billion euros a year in trade. Guess how much trade there is between Gaza and the EU? Just about zero. Nothing. And you know what we do? We send aid. But guess what? That aid comes at a price. If you want our aid, then you're going to go with the program. If you don't want to go with the program, you're not getting the aid. It's bribe money. That's what it is. It's hurting the Palestinians. The Israelis control the aid game, and we are feeding into it by investing the vast majority of our energy into aid. The Palestinians will never be able to live a dignified life on aid. It's not possible. So if it's not me and what I'm doing, someone out there, some of us have business skills, trade skills. We need to do this, to bust open that door and allow the Palestinians an opportunity to live a dignified life. Now I'm happy to meet with any and all of you who think that you have something to offer. Skills in trade, commerce, business, law, web design, IT. But you know what? They send in bill traders. And I tell you what, anyone who wants to work with me is going to state who you are publicly. You're not going to be able to do it clandestinely. And if you change your spots, if you're an infiltrator, God have mercy on your soul. my brother who was on the Mavi Marmara, a good brother, and I'll tell you what, that, that's, that's what I have to say, but in parting, in parting, look, look, really, seriously, <laughs> we do not have to accept this. We can make a better world, and believe me, people are followers. People are followers. They will follow. So if enough of us are courageous enough, intelligent enough, determined enough, and we set the example, they will follow. So let us stop waiting for someone else. Lead by example and affect the world by example. Together we can make it so.
Thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you to the organizers very, very much. Thank you very much. of my journey to Gaza because we have a time short. On the first journey when we arrived in Gaza after a 26 days long up and down journey, we've been beaten all by Egyptian military in al -Aris, in the first convoy and the second convoy with according proper plan B. We tolerated all that with everybody, everyone's dua and support. On the first journey, first journey when we arrived in Gaza, the people in Gaza, like Brother Ken O'Keefe said, they are very strong, very intelligent, and very well, well, well welcoming people. When we arrived in Gaza, the, people, the bro brothers said to me, when fire takes place in the building, people run away from the fire. And what made you do to run towards the fire? I didn't know a word to answer that question. He said, brothers, all of you, what you did, what you guys here, is lot more than what you bring along with you. You know, we carried lots of about 100 vehicles with aid, money, donation, which has been donated from you people from here. We met people in Gaza, which is undescribable. You know, when we go back home in India and Pakistan, we take our money, 100, 200 rupees to distribute the money. Before you calculate the money, money goes out of the hand. And we were carrying thousands of pounds in our hands in Gaza. To distribute. When we meet the brothers, they do handshake, do salam, and they stand like this and they put the hands in the pocket. We take the hands out of the pocket and we open the hands and we give them the money. Then they'll take it. They say, brother, your present is more than this money here. The people living there in the tents, they said, when we're giving them money, this is no, there are more needy people over there than here. Just imagine how strong they are. On one occasion, there was one six year old girl selling the mint in the street. So we were four or five brothers walking past and we just said we buy it so we can, we can have some money. So we pick up one body of mint and we give her a five sake and we start walking off. That little girl stood up and just said, Sheikh, take your chains with you or take the five more from here. Just imagine how stronger they are. And if we're not gonna support them, we will be questioned on the day of the judgment. We have to remember this. If you cannot do anything, make sure you remember in your du'as. And I advise each and everyone here, we believe we go on holiday every year here and there in local, but if you take your children to the Palestine, in the Gaza, on the West Bank, Mazidi Aksa, you will feel the pain, what they've been going through for the last 60 years. You know, if we're not gonna feel that pain, we will be questioned on the day of the judgment. We've got lots of stories to tell you. I'll tell you one story. I've got lots of stories, but just tell you the one main one. There was sister, See, her water was broken, she would deliver a baby any minute. And Israeli has blocked the access to the medical assistant. This is called the ambulance. And when the ambulance arrived, it was a distance from that window to here. She could hardly even get up. She said, no, you have to walk from here to there. So with a few brothers, we tried to lift her up, and they put an AK-47 on another soul, all the chair. So she has to walk from here. Just imagine how you feel when you're just helpless in that situation. And the brother Ken O'Keefe, what he said, his experience on Omar Manuara, which I have witnessed myself. There's nothing more to say for that. And people have called him all sorts because they wanted to make him more famous to put in false accusation on him. I have traveled with Ken O'Keefe twice. Second journey was Road to Hope. We had a very hard time in Libya when Egyptians did not allow to go across from there to Gaza, which is about two days journey from the Libyan border to the Gaza border. I returned, but Brother Ken O'Keefe managed to go to Gaza and spend six months. While his family behind, she was expecting baby. And his first baby had arrived while he was in Gaza. Just imagine when he's needed desperately next to his family, and he was spending, giving his more valuable time to loved ones in Gaza. When a person been accused like that, it's unbelievable. Probably, like he said, unless one time wants to make him more famous. What he's planning to do in the future, in a couple of weeks' time, I request you all.
to support him from the bottom of your heart and trust him by all means. If we're not going to do anything to change the situation in Gaza or anywhere, we will be questioned on the day of judgment. Nowadays we've got technology, we've got lots of message, media and all that. If you follow that, you'll find the truth. We're more busy watching films, we're more busy watching dramas on telly. Why can we not spend like getting more facts out of the world that our loved ones going through in the Middle East? Every day they're going through a lot of hells. The time we've, we've been through on Imam Imarwana, our hands were tied up behind our back and kept us nailed down position for the first six hours. My personal hand was tied up for nearly 20 hours. Some other brother was more than 24 hours. I've been stripped twice and interrogated because I was carrying large amount of donation which is donated from you long one from here. We prepared from both in, in uh, medical equipment, <coughs> 35,000 pound medical equipment. We took it to Turkey when we loaded onto ship from there. Then we traveled from there. On that boat, there were 700 people on the boat and the youngest passenger was a one year old child from the captain's son. Just imagine the courage of the mother. She was carrying a one year old child on that journey. And Israelis did not have a single respect for that. An eldest person on that boat was 87 year old Bishop's father from the Jerusalem, which was been recently released from Israeli prison. The, the reason he was in prison for four years, because he stood up for his rights, for Palestinian rights. There were lots of things, and everything is put under the blanket there. There's nothing on the media. So we need to wake up. If we're not going to wake up, when are we going to wake up? After we die, we will be questioned heavily. So put our entertainment, excitement, time on the side and put important, valuable time to help humans' life, no matter who they are, what color they are. If we put four different colors, fingers on here, put a knife on what color the blood's going to come out, all red. So my request <laughs> to first and last, help Brother Ken O'Keefe, by all means, whatever way you can. If nothing, just make dua for him to success for his journey. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, Jazakallah khair to all the brothers and for yourselves. This is a specific patient, mashallah. We've had for, uh, it's been a long talk, but it's a thought provoking talk, mashallah, in which, my dear respected brothers, the central message, the central message is that you have to, or we have to, and you question, think, and think about the things that we can actually make effort on, my dear brothers. We hear the news, we read, but we never do anything. We never think, actually, what can I do? What can I change? Uh, and the whole focus of this particular talk is constantly about what we can do differently. What can we do? What can we challenge? Constructively challenge, not with just raw emotion, not with just, uh, as some people say, with jazba or anything like that, but constructively, with evidence. You know, the, the statements Ken has made here uh, when we were talking about 9-11 and things like that, you know, they're, they're all out there. The facts are all out there. Just search, critique, think, and judge for yourselves and what have you, inshallah. We'll open up the floor for questions, inshallah. I've got a couple. There's the mobile number there uh, if you want to text. Uh, if you want to text uh, the, the question, if you don't want to ask it, just text it to us. Uh, inshallah, we'll take a couple of questions at a time, and then inshallah, Ken will respond to it. Please make the, if you're making a statement, keep it very short, but if it's a question, please just keep it short. Yeah, not, not a full uh, on bayan, inshallah. Um, the, first, the first few that I've got on the form, actually, which I'll just read out because they're quite quick. Uh, again, there's quite a few messages here thanking Ken for coming and also yourself for coming as well. Um, I'm sorry, you wanted to say yeah. something before? Brother, one thing I forgot, like Brother Ken O'Keefe said, uh, you should not have any fear in your life. What fear we should have? If you've done something wrong, then you'll have a fear. Right? Like Brother Ken said, it's not fear for his life. And one miracle on the ship, on Amabi Marmara, one of my best mates, which is Ken O'Keefe knows, is called Esan. He's Palestinian, Israeli Arab. He had a two bullet back of his head. Back of his head. One bullet 
came out under just below his nose, one landed in his mouth, and he spit it out. <laughs> and it was kicked, and it all his face up, and it was so on the abdomen. Alhamdulillah, he survived. Those brothers, 70 brothers, who were seriously injured, the injured, they were injured so bad, Alhamdulillah, they all survived. There was still one brother, still in coma, nearly coming to two years. When he had a bullet, I, I remember all his injuries. And another thing is, uh, when I was young, and uh, we were listening to all these from Maulana, that when brothers get martyred, Sahid, the blood smelled like a musk. And Alhamdulillah, I have experienced that. All my clothes was full of the, all the brothers who passed Sahid on the boat. All my clothes were fully blooded. When we were in Israeli jail, our teeth said was sweat, you know, stink with the sweat. But when you smell that blood, it smelled like the musk. So just remember, the martyr never goes in the way. They always remember. Zakallah. Okay, the first question I've got uh, for Ken, uh, inshallah, is, is with regards to um, his time uh, as a Marine, and then actually what made him actually take the cause up of justice. Uh, and then there's another question saying, thank you for coming today and being so honest and not afraid of speaking the truth. Uh, in life, what made you change the stars and stripes for the Palestinian cause? Well, as, as life, life, life is, the irony of life is so amazing. The best thing that ever happened to me was my Marine Corps experience because while I was in the Marines, I ended up speaking out about something. I believed the Marine Corps was about honor and integrity and leadership by example. And at a certain point, I was a very respected Marine. I did my job well. And uh, my leaders were violating their position of power. I ended up speaking out about this. And I thought the only way to do that honorably would to be to do it openly. I could have done it clandestinely or secretly, but I did it openly. When I did that, and my, my uh, superiors found out about it, <laughs> basically they punished the hell out of me and they made my life hell. Um, they also punished the entire platoon so that they knew they were being punished because of me, which meant I had to look over my shoulder continuously. <coughs> and the point is, this was my first real taste of injustice. I hadn't done the wrong thing, I had done the right thing. And I was being punished. And when that happened to me, that transformed me. It just totally transformed me. I realized I'm wrong about the Marine Corps. What else am I wrong about? So that kind of leads to the second question. So that injustice was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, as far as the US and changing you know, Palestine, I mean, I look at citizenship in purely uh, logical terms. Citizenship is a contract. Whether we like it or not, it's a social contract of which we're entered into it at birth. Under the contract, we have rights, supposedly, and we have obligations, such as paying taxes, such as following the laws, so on and so forth. If you really understand law, you understand that the law is set up to protect the rich and the powerful and to exploit all of you and extract as much money from you as possible and effectively maintain you as a slave. So I don't really have respect for the laws. I have respect for obvious laws. You don't kill people, you don't steal from people, you don't lie, you don't defraud people, you don't do any of that stuff. But I don't have respect for laws that violate my human right or other people's human rights. And so I don't agree to the contract. I renounced my US citizenship because I didn't agree to the contract, especially paying taxes into a system that's being used to murder my brothers and sisters halfway around the world based on a bunch of lies. I don't make enough money in the UK to actually be in a tax bracket, but I would openly, I would, I would have to be my own boss because I just simply could not do a regular job where the taxes are automatically taken out and I know that my work is going to fund this. And I'm not passing judgment, please don't get me wrong. You have to put food on the table, you have to take care of your family. I just, at a certain point, I, I needed to do this. Maybe it's because I was a Marine. Maybe I feel an extra obligation to do more because of my stupidity and my mistake. Palestine, for me, <laughs> I'm also an Irish citizen. I love the Irish. I mean, I love the Irish. You know, the, they're, they're not like the rest of the Europeans, really. I mean, you know, they, they, they were called the white niggers of Europe, for Christ's sake. They've been treated, you know, horrendously. Before it was the Muslims, it was the Irish. There used to be no blacks, no dogs, and no Irish. 
in many a pub. So I love the Irish. I love their fighting spirit. So I, I'm, I'm, I love Ireland. I love the Irish people. Palestinians, the Palestinians are just a beautiful people. I'm blessed and honored to consider myself a Palestinian and to have been embraced by the Palestinians. Citizenship is not about you know, where you're born. It has everything to do with who you are and who you give your allegiance to. And I'm also a Hawaiian national, by the way. Hawaii is an occupied land. America stole Hawaii, and there is a Hawaiian movement to reestablish their nation. I'm part of that. I am a Hawaiian national. And the only reason why I don't live in Hawaii is because it's America, and I don't want to be in America. And it probably is a good idea that I'm not in America anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, question from the floor. Do you want to This country is using the weapon of Islamophobia to keep the majority of this country ignorant of what actually <coughs> happens in Palestine. The, the Christians in Palestine, I'm not sure of the percentage, are, are they affected by the same sufferings that the, the Muslim Palestinians are suffering for? And if we got a message from the Christians in Palestine, do you think it would help the cause for Muslim brothers and sisters to get together with the Christian, the good living Christian brothers and sisters of this country and in America to fight together for the cause? Yeah. Um, I, in Israel, I mean, priests uh, are spit on uh, regularly. There is open, uh, flagrant abuse of Christians in the holy city of Jerusalem. It is ongoing and continuous, and it really is quite remarkable. Whereas there are Christians in uh, Gaza, there are definitely Christians in the West Bank, and their experience is similar to the experience of Jews who've lived in Iran, who've lived in other Muslim lands. They're fine. It's not the uh, Palestinian Muslims who are the problem for the Christians, it's the Israelis that are the problem. Um, and the irony, really, people who call themselves Christians, I find this to be really quite remarkable. How dare you call yourself a Christian? George Bush claims to be a Christian. Tony Blair claims to be a Catholic. What kind of Christian is that? It's like, you know, who would Jesus bomb? You know, what kind of Christian bombs people, you know, and tortures people? How dare you call yourself a Christian? And, you know, the idea... The, the fact is that it's the Christian Zionists in America which are, you know, supporting Israel hugely financially. God, the stupidity is so incredible that you're actually supporting an entity, a Zionist entity, a Jewish supremacist Zionist entity, which actually looks at you as cattle. And yet you're paying them money to support them and actually go work for free in the you know, kibbutzes and things like this. I think, yes, Christians have a very important role to play both inside Palestine and outside Palestine. And especially if you have any connection to the land of Jesus, who was a Palestinian. <laughs> he was, as Malcolm X made so clear, what was that white guy you have pictured there? He was a, he was a Palestinian, you know? If you, how can you support the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, which is killing Palestinians who are blood related to Jesus Christ? Literally, you're paying for the murder of the descendants of Jesus Christ. So, I don't know. I think that's a, one of the ways to try and reach Christians. Is how how can you possibly do this? You know, for love of Jesus Christ, for love of justice, uh, you can't be supporting this. And you know, like you said, you've been in Gaza two, two or three times. On your travels, have you met any, like, let's say, Palestinian Israelites or Israelis that have actually looked at you and said, you know, we want to help you, but we can't? Or is it all complete oppression? That's, that's my question. Yeah, no, no, I, I have met uh, 
really courageous Israelis. In fact, a very good friend of mine, Gilad Atzman, who's also being targeted big time. They say he's a racist, he's an anti-Semite. This is a good man. And ultimately, you know, he served in the IDF, in the Israeli Defense Forces, or the Israeli Offense Forces. And he, he, his father, his grandfather was a rabid Zionist right-winger. He grew up in the Israeli indoctrinated society. Um, and he's one of the biggest uh, opponents to the state of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, and is speaking out against uh, the, the state of Israel. And he's also being targeted by some Palestinians who are saying that this man should not be allowed to talk because he's about anti-Semitism and all. It's a lie, an absolute lie. I, I, I know another brother who I met recently from Israel who contacted me uh, who, who also is a courageous guy who goes into the West Bank on a regular basis. There are good people in Israel. In fact, really courageous because they're, they're facing an incredibly indoctrinated, oftentimes <coughs> violent society, which will treat you as a rabid traitor uh, for even thinking to speak on behalf of the Palestinians. So it takes quite a bit of courage, and there are people who do it. But to be fair, they are a rather extreme minority, sadly. And, and this is, you know, part of the reason why I'm also getting attacked is because I continue to point out the fact that this isn't just about Zionism. This is not. In fact, in, in, in Israel, Zionism isn't even an issue. They don't even talk about Zionism. It's, it's Jewish people outside and us that talk about Zionism. Inside Israel, it's not a factor. But the fact is that the Israeli state is the Jewish state of Israel. And the fact is that in Britain, they enjoy probably at least 90% support for the state of Israel amongst the Jewish population. In America, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 95% support. Inside of the Jewish state, about 94% supported the uh, slaughter in the Gaza Operation Cast Lead. This is also a Jewish thing. And this is where I do find some difference with some Muslims in that I'm not going to blame all Jews. That's crazy. Of course there are good Jewish people. And I consider the most offensive Jews, along with the most humane and courageous Jews, all of them to be my brothers and sisters. However, some of my brothers and sisters are acting in a very offensive way. And I believe that any people, any people who subscribe to a supremacist ideology, if you believe that you are the chosen ones, and that somehow God has chosen you and, forget, and gave you the right to treat others as less than you, that you are a threat to everyone. I don't care whether you call yourself a Muslim or a Christian, a Nazi or a Jew. It makes no difference to me. If you believe you're special and God made you better than someone else, that is an offensive belief and it's a threat to all of us. And, and when you combine the Jewish supremacist ideology, which is prevalent, with the kind of power that Jewish people have as an extreme minority in this world, if you say that kind of thing, <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, you must be a fraudster. You, you're probably a rapist. I, the next thing, I'm a, I'm a pedophile as well, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'll be guilty of everything. When you speak the truth, especially on this subject, which is probably the most taboo subject of all, well, you can rest assured you're going to have some issues. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, there's a sister there at the back. Please, could you elaborate some more on the Absolutely. Specialist educators in particular, um, especially if you speak Arabic, not completely necessary, but especially for those who speak Arabic, there's a lot of need for that. All of the children and adults have been traumatized to one level or another. They need some help and support beyond what standard education provides. So anybody who has any kind of skills in this regard could be highly useful. Women are, of course, welcome. Um, and this trip, the way it's being done is I'm, I'm focused on at least a certain number of key people who have a significant amount of influence, who have an audience, and, and they're very important to be on this trip because it will give it maximum exposure and publicity. And we need for people to be educated and understand exactly what we're doing here. What makes it totally different from anything that's ever been done is that it is being done in a commercial capacity. Now, when you do it this way, it changes everything. As we can all understand, 
the world is set up to protect the rich and to protect business. And I have studied for the last several years trade. Not because I, I don't, you know, this is not my passion. The reason why I've studied it is because the Palestinians have made clear, and I've listened to them, that they need to be able to conduct trade in order to be able to live a dignified life. So I committed myself to understanding trade. The amazing thing is that there are trade, there are treaties, international treaties, between the EU, all the EU member states, and partner countries in the Mediterranean region. They include all the, the Mediterranean countries that you would think of, from uh, Libya to Tunisia to Egypt to Israel to Palestine. Palestine is one of the partner countries, Lebanon, Syria. They have agreements that are both multilateral, i.e. the agreements between the European Union and all the partner countries, and then they have bilateral agreements between the EU and the individual partner countries. Now, in those agreements, you cannot conduct uh, any barriers to trade. The laws are set up to protect trade, especially for big business and whatnot. Now, the difference between having, if I say, okay, we're going to take a coach to Gaza and we're doing it because we're humanitarians and we know what's right and humanitarian law and whatnot, if you do it that way, basically you have a million different obstacles and you can't make the same argument that we're going to be able to make. Because when we do it, our coach is going to be completely commercially licensed, commercially insured, commercially permitted with a European-based company, and if anyone stands in our way, such as Egypt, as you would expect under Mubarak, if Egypt tries to stop us or says, oh no, you can't come from that direction, you have to take a ferry into El Arish, and now by taking that ferry, the cost is jacked up by 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars to be able to get a special ferry to take you there, you can't conduct business that way. You can't, it's too expensive. How can you conduct business that way? <laughs> You have to have access. If somebody stands in your way, I have the best trade attorney that probably you can get in London who's given me 40 pages of legal advice as to why we have a right to conduct trade. Now, if Egypt were to interfere with us, the first thing that will be done, and we need some money for this. This is the problem. I can't get a trade attorney to work completely for free. I've got a lot of work from him for very little, but it's not possible to get that kind of work for free. It takes money. So this trade attorney is ready to go, when we head towards Gaza, if Egypt plays any funny little games, first off, it's going to tick off their population a little bit because under Mubarak, we all knew he was a stooge for the Zionists, a puppet and a prostitute for them, so we all knew that we were going to have problems there. But now, it's not Mubarak anymore, and the Egyptian people are getting a little bit tired with not seeing real change. And if they stop our mission, what are we going to do? We're going to say, well, you don't have Mubarak, but you have the same exact policies. And here we are trying to do something for Palestine and look to what we find. Exactly what we found under Mubarak. But we don't have to just cry foul. That's what we would do if we were a humanitarian thing. We would cry foul and say this is wrong and we would pitch the biggest fit that we could. We'll do that but we will also immediately with our trade attorney launch a formal complaint to the European Commission. Now the reason why I want to do this is because the European Union is guilty. Guilty of supporting the blockade of Gaza. Guilty. And if once we file a complaint with the European Commission and say, listen, this is an EU-based company, it's conducting lawful trade and commerce, we have fulfilled all of our obligations under international law, trade law, commerce law, and Egypt is blocking us, and this is causing a barrier to trade which makes it impossible to do business, and yet the EU has an agreement with the Palestinians to be able to conduct trade. The moment they do that, we file the complaint with the European Commission. Now, the European Commission has two basic pass. One, they play their little games and give us that excuse, this excuse, or another excuse, and what we will say at that point is that the European Union has gone from tacit consent, tacit consent, to an illegal blockade, which is a form of collective punishment, which is victimizing the over 800,000 children that live in Gaza. We've gone from tacit consent to active support, and that is the position of the European Commission, which is correct, because the European Union is guilty doing 25 billion euros a year plus with Israel while handing out a few crumbs in the form of aid to the Palestinians so they can live like beggars. It's, it's a game and they're guilty. We're guilty for allowing them to get away with this. So if nothing else, if nothing else, we're going to force that issue. We'll expose Egypt for doing exact. and I don't want to. I want Egypt to just do the right thing. And I believe we can do that. And we will do everything we can to make sure that Egypt does the right thing. 
everything. But if they don't do the right thing, then they should be exposed. And their Muslim Brotherhood leaders who are coming into power, how's that going to look? Muslim Brotherhood? And you're doing exactly what that pimp prostitute Mubarak did? I don't know, but I, I, I would hope that the Muslims of Egypt are going to say that's not acceptable. So we need to do this. And this is the reason why I've been targeted. They sent infiltrators. I made mistakes. This is why. They've slandered me. They've tried to get me to quit. I'm not going to quit. And this is the thing, too. This needs to be bigger than me. I'm closer to getting a few of the key people that I need. But let's say they take me out in one way or the other. They can frame me. If they can carry out 9-11, they can frame me. You know what? It's not possible to frame me? Of course it is. So I don't know. Maybe they take me out of the picture, frame me for some bogus junk. You know, there needs to be other people who do this. I've done, I've done a huge amount of work. The vast majority of this work has gone with absolutely no pay, none. I got a little bit of pay in the first few months of doing this with the initial investors. Uh, nothing. Poverty level pay. It wouldn't even put me in the taxable bracket. It's that low. It's half of that. So, and since that time, over three years, I've not gotten any pay, nothing. In fact, it's cost me money. So I'm not in this for the money, but what I want to do is set up a regular route between Gaza and Europe, and it'll probably be based in Italy. So we're going in, dropping people off. Palestinians are going to be able to get on that bus, that coach, and we're taking you out. And then we're going right back, and then we're going right back. We're going back and forth. And as soon as you step in our way, we're, far, we're filing the complaint. And if the EU plays its game, you're guilty. 25 billion a year plus with Israel. And you're not protecting an EU-based company that is conducting trade in accord with your own laws. So it has to be done one way or the other. I believe we can succeed. I think with the fall of Mubarak, the people of Egypt are not willing to tolerate this kind of nonsense anymore. It's an insult to them. It shames them. And I don't believe the Muslim Brotherhood wants to find itself in a position to defend the continuation of the blockade of Gaza. I really don't. So this is totally different. There are going to be about 50 seats. They're going to be about 500 quid each. I already know that I've got several of them sold. If I get a little bit more money for some key things that need to be done before we announce this plan, if I get a few more things done, we're going. We are going. So, you know, there's no reason why we can't do it. And the cost to do this, you know, in, in real terms, the cost to do this is it's less than 20,000 pounds. I've already bought the coach. It's not that much money. It's not. And if we sell the tickets, you know, the problem is if we sell the tickets to get the money to do some of the key things that need to be done now. You know, it's kind of the chicken or the egg, which comes first. So I believe we're going to be there soon. But I'll tell you what, expertise in certain things. I've got the people I need to be able to do what we need to do to commercially set ourselves up. I've got that. But I need a little bit of money for some, from a few things. And what I'm willing to do for sure at this point is any money that is given I will, I will answer to exactly how that money is spent, and I will guarantee that no one will get paid, including myself. I will continue to do this work for free, and I have set a benchmark for myself, which I've been honest about always. I will, I will, if this company succeeds in getting in and out of Palestine, achieving that goal of opening up trade and actually providing access to travel for the Palestinians, at a certain point, I'm actually going to take a very modest salary so that I can actually support my family properly. Because I have not supported my family. I have not. And if I were to be criticized for any one thing, it would be that I've given so much to the cause that I have not given to my own wife and children. Not financially, not even emotionally, missing the birth of my child. You know, I'm asking a lot of a wife, I tell you, an awful lot. I mean, you know, I know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good guy, but I'm asking a lot, an awful lot. I need to make a little bit of money. And I'm definitely not in this for the money, but if we can break open that door, I'm going to take a bit of a salary. A very modest one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last question. I've had a couple of questions on the phone just saying thank you for coming. Uh, and well, thank you for enlightening us and things like that. So I, do, I don't want people to think I'm not looking at the phone. <laughs> okay, has anybody else got one last question? I know it's late. Yeah. Go ahead. There's one again. Yeah, hi. Um, you talked about World War III um, coming. Some people say it's already here. Some people say World War III is already here. And you talked about it coming. Uh, we'll be, uh, 
it's called, uh, is it already? Actually, yeah, to be correct, full-scale World War III. We already have a world war. There's war in Pakistan, there's war in Afghanistan, there's war in Iraq, there's been a war in Libya, there's been war in Syria. That qualifies as a world war. So full-scale World War III is what I'm talking about. Full-scale, i.e., we know, clearly. Even the former head of Mossad, I mean, the motto of Mossad is, by way of deception, thou shalt foster war. I mean, that's what they're all about. Even the former head of Mossad said in the last few weeks that uh, the, uh, the idea of attacking Iran is the stupidest thing he has ever heard. That's the head of Mossad, the former head of Mossad. It is, clearly. But the thing is, I think we one very important point. We cannot, when we look at the world, if you want to try and understand the world, and you look at the world through the view of sanity, it's all very confusing. It really is. Nothing makes sense. Because how could we be doing this? You have to look at the world from the view of a tyrant, from the view of a sociopath. You have to look at the world that way. And you have to understand that a tiny minority holds all the cards primarily through the financial system. You need to understand it through the filter of these tiny minority of tyrants know that in order for them to maintain power, they have to have two very key ingredients. One, which they screwed up on, they have to control information. Throughout human history, the tyrants have always controlled information. But now with the advent of the internet, they do not control it. Granted, a lot of people are watching the rubbish and buying the rubbish but a lot of people are not. And with the knowledge that they're getting from having access to the truth, this is empowering. This is a real problem for the powers that be. The other thing that they need to be able to do to maintain their system of power is to divide people. If people come together, that's it. The jig is up and they are done. So they know that knowledge and wisdom is increasing. They know that people are accessing information on an unprecedented level. They know that the consciousness of humanity is rising like never before. They know that in the Arab world where people have been historically in recent history been willing to accept, or at least very few have been willing to fight against the puppets, now they're standing up in mass. They know that people in the West are starting to act in larger and larger numbers. They know this. So they need something to be able to maintain their grip on power, and what would that be? Attack Iran, Iran will respond. When Iran responds, Israel will do what? More than likely, they're going to launch nukes. If that happens, don't trust the leaders in Pakistan either. Don't trust them. I wouldn't trust any government as far as I could throw it anyway. So you never know what treasonous levels of uh, corruption exist. <coughs> In Pakistan as well, let's say one nuke goes a little off course. Oh, there's our excuse. Now we're launching nukes. Indian, pa this is what could happen, a chain reaction. This not only could happen just as a matter of accident or you know, unintentionally as they'll try and play it out. There is a lot of evidence, huge amounts of evidence to suggest. In fact, there's a great film from Freedom to Fascism, a guy named Aaron Russo, quickly. He became friends with uh, Nick Rockefeller. He told him, several months before 9-11, about 9-11, he told him what was going to happen. And he became friends with this guy. The Rockefellers are obviously a connected family. They're a banking family. They've got a lot of power. He basically was trying to recruit him. And they became friends. But he told him many things. And what he said was, you know, why, why he, the guy Aaron Russo, he asked him, like, why are you doing this? You, know, you have all the money. You, you, know, you have all this power. You know, what, what do you want? He said, well, we want complete control, total control of everything and everyone. We own everything, we control everyone. How are you going to do it? We're going to microchip everyone. Your microchip is going to have your money. And if we don't like you, we just set it to zero. Good luck to you. There will be no cash. We will control you that way. We will microchip you based on whatever lies, you know, some disease or you know, whatever to be able to excuse them to do this. They want to control the planet. They want to depopulate the planet. He told them that as well. But the powers that be know that with nearly 7 billion people on the planet, many of them becoming aware this is a problem. If the peasants unite, 
they have no chance in hell. None. Like I said, they'll be lucky if they're only hanging from a lamppost at that point. So there is a plan to depopulate the planet. How would you do that? You'll have to create a cover. The cover will be a nuclear war, instigated by the same people who claim to be trying to defend us. The threat is Iran. And, and got, we've got to know this, don't we? Iran has not invaded a nation for hundreds of years. It only fought a war with Iraq because Iraq was carrying out the orders of its paymasters in America. It wouldn't have fought a war with Iraq if it weren't for that. Iran has no nuclear weapons, although I wish they did, because quite frankly, America is so cowardly, they don't attack people with nuclear weapons. They don't attack North Korea. They don't attack the Russians. They don't attack anyone that can fight back. So the best thing that Iran could probably do is get nukes and make it clear we have nukes, at which point the American people and the Europeans would not allow it. Why would you attack Iran? <laughs> They have nukes, and they're going to nuke us back. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's agreed destruction. The bottom line is this. There is every reason to believe that the powers that be want to depopulate the planet. They're crazy. You can't think, again, you can't think sanely. And they have underground compounds. And if you haven't gotten an invite yet, you're not invited. <clears throat> so while the nukes are blowing up, and Israel has said, by the way, Israel has said publicly that if they feel that their existence is threatened, they are willing to use nukes against Europe, as well as other nations. So Israel, the nation that is afraid of the nuclear weapons of Iran, which has no nuclear weapons, while they have hundreds of nuclear weapons, and has openly said they're willing to bomb Europe with nuclear weapons if they feel their existence is threatened, which their existence is already threatened. The Israeli project will not continue. I don't care how much power they have. They will not survive. No way. The Jewish state, the Zionist state, will not continue. It will not. Whether it's the end of the world in a nuclear war, or whether justice being served is the end of the Zionist project, it's going to happen one way or the other. So we're, we're already aware of the fact that Israel's going to launch nukes. So who's the threat? Iran? What a joke. But it's a serious joke, and it's one that threatens all of us. What do they fear? What do they fear if he's a, what do you call him? Leaders. What do they fear? Yeah. The Israelis? Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, the whole point of Israel is to maintain perpetual conflict. They are also largely a sociopathic, uh, schizophrenic society. They are indoctrinated with fear continuously. You know, they, they, they all freak out when a few glorified rockets, uh, fireworks, are fired into southern Israel. You know, the Palestinians are dealing with that a thousand times over. They don't freak out. They go on with their lives. They're so traumatized to their Holocaust conditioning and all of this stuff. We've always been victims and yet incapable of realizing that Jewish people have, throughout history, over and over and over again been expelled. And yet, this is apparently because everyone just simply is inherently anti-Jewish and just wishes to victimize them. It has nothing to do with their behavior. It has nothing to do with usury. It has nothing to do with fostering all of these crimes. So it is a very uh, dangerous and seriously unstable population. And it's understandable. And this is part of why, actually, I mean, in truth, you know, I feel for them. I genuinely feel for the Israeli people and the Jewish people. They have been stripped of the most precious thing that we have, in my opinion, our humanity. Once you give that up, <laughs> you don't have God. You can't have God without humanity. They go together. So God's chosen ones, what a joke. They are, I hope that we can somehow bring the people of Israel together with us to explain to them in non-negotiable terms, you shall not continue the way you are acting. This behavior is completely and totally unacceptable. It is the greatest threat to all of us. Your sociopathic, psychopathic, lying ways is threatening all of us. <clears throat> we cannot allow this. It's inevitable that we will destroy ourselves if we allow this kind of manic behavior to continue backed by nuclear weapons. So one way or the other, it's coming to a head. The fear is propagated within the Israeli population to defend the offensive actions which these puppets carry out at the behest of the real powers, which are never in the public eye. Those who have the real power are never the prime ministers and the politicians. 
They are all puppets. That is rare exception. No, sorry, I have to end it here because it is running very late. Once again, I would like to thank Ken O'Keefe for coming and also for yourselves for being patient and listening. I hope, inshallah, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things, you know, which we've reiterated constantly is that it, it is not just about listening and going away from this talk or many other talks that we hear many time time again. We always hear the concept that we have to put something into practice, we have to do something that is active, and something that is beneficial for us and for our community worldwide and what have you. The whole concept of this talk was to give you an understanding and appreciation of the different dynamics, of the different stories, and the different perspectives out there of the things that are happening around us. Because sometimes when we're in our lives, you know, it's, it's very easy, you know, you come home, you go to work, you go, you come home, family, work, home, family. You're just sort of locked into that dynamic. So hearing these things, the idea is that you are outside of that dynamic for you to think, for you to question, rightly critique, and to rightly ask these things. So my dear respected brothers, respected sisters, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing I hope you take from this is to question and to think, what can I actively do? In that respect, yeah, mashallah, most of you, as you came in, you saw the stall there and everything, the Friends of Al-Aqsa stall. Uh, there is a Dewsbury Batley branch of Friends of Al-Aqsa here. Mashallah, most of the brothers here uh, have all helped organize this event. So brothers and sisters are requested, inshallah, put your names down. Whatever you can do, whether it is, whether it is, you know, tell other people about events, whether it is actually turning up to events, whether just to pass that information along, or if you can take a more active role Inshallah, on the 1st of April, which is next Sunday, I think, yes, I think it's next Sunday. On the 1st of April, inshallah, we will be uh, having another meeting of the Friends of Alexa Dewsbury Batley branch. We humbly request you participate in this. Take an active part, uh, what you call it, participation in it, and suggest something out of the box, something novel, like Ken's doing here, is he's absolutely right. Trade, trade is fantastic. The aid. Aid has its position. Aid has its responsibility. Giving aid, you know, it is needed. Yeah? Like, you know, mashallah, most of you are aware of Ismail Bai Patel. Uh, what do you call it? From Friends of Alexa. You know, one of the biggest things I was saying recently in the Mashwera was that what we need now is, yes, we're taking people across to Palestine. We're taking people across there. But who we need to take here, those people who are so locked in this other dynamic, whose eyes are still closed, the politicians, the people who, you know, out there that can make a difference, local people, local people who can make a difference. So not just taking humanitarian aid, we're taking people across there to open up their eyes so that they can cause a chain reaction. So my dear respect brothers, please do put your names down. Please do, I mean the sheets out there are literally like this, I'm just take, please print your email addresses because last time we did this here, yeah, Lots of people scribble their email addresses here. Yeah? We can't actually send anything to anybody, yeah? So actually print your email addresses, yeah? But please do actually stand and actually write and come along and participate. Because the brothers here, we're all voluntary. We're all doing it off our backs. We've all got families and what have you, yeah? We need your help. We need your assistance. We need your dwarves. And more importantly, we need to think about things which will bring out the whole of the community. Because this isn't just a Muslim issue. This isn't just a Muslim issue. This is a humanity issue. It's the basis of about what is happening to our humanity. And that is the concept of which we, we've touched upon now, about the concept of world war and things like that. Because this is our whole humanity disappearing here. Okay? I'm gonna stop there, inshallah. Once again, I'd like to thank everybody. And I think Ken wants to just say one very brief thing, inshallah. Um, thank you genuinely. I mean, it's really fantastic to see on a Sunday evening a room full of people. It really is brilliant. And I appreciate very much what you've done and you honor me by your time. So thank you. And please, actually, I'll, I'll have four pieces of paper up here. If you have something to offer, whatever it is, please make sure you put your email address or some contact information. And I will send you a more detailed, with you, sister, and anybody else, I will send something with more details in writing so you can actually see what is the plan and what you might be able to do to contribute to it. 
And I'm here, so I'll, I'm happy to speak to anybody as well. <coughs> if you will, please. If you're serious, I mean, really, as, as Brother's saying here, I mean, come on. It ain't going to just happen. We'll make it so. It's not up to me. It's up to us. So there's got to be some people in this room who have something meaningful to offer. And if we don't have that in this room, then I'm not sure exactly what we're doing. So thank you all very, very much. And I hope I see you. Inshallah, there will be here. a dua. There will be a dua. Hafiz Wasim will do a very short, brief dua. Because penultimately, my dear brothers, with movement, everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why it's important that we turn back to Allah to make that dua, to ask forgiveness, and ask acceptance that He utilizes us, inshallah. <laughs>